Hello, and welcome back to Abominations of Fan Fiction. Now, I know a lot of you are probably confused seeing that this is part two and I'm saying welcome back. Well, I did a part one, but that was over two years ago. So, uh, a lot of you probably haven't seen it, but, you know, I figured now's a good time to get back into it. So, today I decided to go with a theme for the fan fictions I'm looking at, and I decided, well, let's, let's look at stuff from our childhoods, or at least from my childhood, my generation's childhood, and see what kind of weird shit they could come up with. And I'm not gonna go for, the, like, the weird sex ones, because I feel like that's just getting a cheap laugh, and, you know, I could get in trouble for putting that on YouTube, so we're just gonna avoid that and go for the other odd stuff. Also, real quick, before anyone asks, uh, I know it's not totally in frame there, so the, that, it's a Berserk poster. There. I knew somebody was gonna ask about it. So, let's go for real now. This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. Alright, so this first one I'm going to be reading is from Rugrats All Grown Up. Now, if you don't remember, Rugrats was a Nickelodeon cartoon all about babies that were talking to each other and stuff. And then All Grown Up was them when they were like 11 and 12 years old. And as kids, we just kind of took it for granted that... 11 was a very mature age, but, uh, you know, whatever. This one is called Rugrats All Grown Up, My Friend from Tokyo. Description, Kimi Pon Paul Sume come to see her, but wait, what's this? It seemed that Tommy has a like to Kimi friend. Read to find out more. This is my first Rugrats story. Uh, all one sentence. And it's written by Sume Sakamiya. All right. Chapter one, her arrival. This story takes place down the street, four blocks away from Tommy's house. As his mom walked outside, ready to drive her son to school, they saw three moving trucks down the street, not far from them. Looks like we are having new neighbors, Mom, said Tommy. It looks like it. Why don't we go and say hi, she said. Let's not, Mom. I mean, they did just move in, and he stopped as he saw a girl jump out of the moving truck with three boys wearing dark blue, light blue, and blizzard blue kimono top and pants with black shoes as the two girls were wearing gold top and pants kimono. As for the first girl, she had on a light purple kimono with black shoes. That's all one sentence. And I don't know if this author is aware of it, but Japanese people don't wear kimonos all the time. Uh, in fact, the majority of them only wear them during, like, certain holidays and ceremonies. And I wouldn't be that bothered by it if it weren't for the fact that Tommy's best friend's stepmom and stepsister are from Japan. Okay. Okay, let's go, said Tommy, as he and his mom walked over to the house. As they approached the house, they see how big it was as women, about 5'8", walked up in a maiden outfit. She had long purple hair and purple eyes and wearing glasses. Can I help you? She said, sweaty, but a bit stern. Uh, yes, we saw that you moved in, so we wanted to welcome you to neighborhood, said Tommy, mom. My name is Dee Dee Pickles, and this is my son Tommy Pickles, she said, of the two women shook hands. It is nice to meet you. My new name is Yumi Sakamea. Are you from Japan? asked Tommy. I feel like... Yeah, whatever. That's a stupid question, said a voice as they looked to see a young boy wearing a light blue outfit with icy blue short hair and blue eyes. Dise, be nice. They're our neighbors, and I don't want any trouble out of you, said Yumi as she glaring at her son as she rolled his eyes and walked back inside. Is he yours? asked Didi. Yes, that is my young son Dise. He's a good boy, but sometimes is a troublemaker. So I guess the other kids and I saw coming out of the truck are your kids too, asked Tommy. Yes, they are. They're inside right now, getting ready for school. Would you like meet them, she asked. Sure, said Tommy. They followed Yumi into house and into the living room and saw two boys bring in the sofa and the girls cleaning up the place as they set the table on the rug and the TV into place. Seriously, dude. Periods. You use them. Kids, I would like you to say hi to Dee Dee and Tommy Pickles. The kids stopped what they were doing and said hi. The older one is Kenichi. Or, I'm sorry, the older one is Kenchi. Then Daisuke, and you already met Dise. Then comes Sana and Hana, but Tommy didn't see the girl wearing the purple kimono. But was... Uh, I, I don't even know what's happening anymore. Okay, so there's like another 47,000 words of that. Uh, I'm, I'm just gonna stop because, God, that is boring. That's just... God, it's boring. This next fanfiction is also based on a children's cartoon. This one is from Jimmy Neutron. It's called The Chronicles of Carla Weezer. Soon after the events of the Jimmy Neutron television series, life takes a downward turn for Carl Weezer. 
While trying to cope with the people he cares about being so tragically taken from him, he must deal with an even more pressing concern. HER identity as a transgender woman. Can Carlo Weezer come to terms with who she is and rise above life's greatest challenges? Oh, the comments on this are gonna be fun, I can tell. Chapter 1. Carl Weezer was once a happy-go-lucky child of Retroville. Some would call him plump, others jolly. Some might even call him big-boned, perhaps husky. No, you're fat. That was four years ago. Everything went downhill when Carl's parents died of lung cancer two years prior. <laughs> Carl, my boy, wheezed Weezer on his deathbed. I don't think I'm gonna make it. No, Papa, cried Carl. You have to. I can't lose both you and Mom in the same week. But then Papa Weeze let out his last wheeze and he dropped dead. Carl Weezer cried for two months straight. <laughs> you know, that was that, that was probably my favorite part of uh of Jimmy Neutron was like just the the dark, edgy tone that it had throughout. It was beautiful. Jimmy, he sobbed on the phone. The government is taking my house. I have nowhere to stay. Hang in there, my boy, said Jimbo. I asked my parents and they said you can come live with me. They'd really take me in, asked Carl, tears of joy forming in his eyes. Yeah, said Jimmy, and so it was. They lived happily, and Carl began to move on and live somewhat of a normal life. But at age 14, Jimmy got accepted into Harvard. Goodbye, said Jimmy. You're really leaving, asked Carl sadly. Yes, said Jimmy. Take care of Mom and Pop. Don't worry, I'll keep in touch. Since Jimmy was at college and Sheen had been lost in space for many years and assumed dead, he had no friends. Wait, Sheen was in space? Oh, right, they did a spin-off show where Sheen got lost in... Okay. Jimmy's parents tried their best to comfort him, but Hugh wasn't very good with kids. When I was seven years old, I sat on a banana, explained Hugh one morning. And of course, it changed my life. Carl let out a light chuckle. Good one, Mr. Neutron. Hey, thanks, my boy, said Hugh, but call me Pop. Carl looked away nervously. I don't think I'm ready to do that yet. Carl smiled warmly. Someday. And, uh... That is the end of chapter one. Uh, there are eight chapters here. I'm not reading any more of them. And now we have some Diary of a Wimpy Kid fanfiction. Uh, this one is called The New Kid by Zack the Boy One. Description. This is a story about me going into the Dairy of a Wimpy Kid universe. Parentheses. The New Kid. End parentheses. Anyways, I hope everybody enjoys the first part of the story and I will make a second if I don't get busy. Enjoy one. You know, self-insert fanfictions are really a dying breed, because, you know, it used to be that was, like, everything that was fanfiction was just, hey, here's me having adventures with these characters, and here's what I would do if I were in this situation, that sort of thing. But nowadays it seems like everybody just wants to write weird sex shit, so I appreciate someone going back to the roots of the, uh, of the medium. Chapter 1. Hello, my name is Zach, and this is me in the... Doak universe. I really got into his because stories got me some easy grades in middle school, so I thought I'd better pay a tribute to the author by putting myself in the story. Trust me, I will try to make this entertaining as possible. If you like Percy Jackson, Naruto, Kane Chronicles, etc., so without farther ado, I present you. The new kid, Greg. So I woke up this morning thinking I was going to have an amazing day, but of course I gotta have a bad one like I always do. This kid called Zack came all the way from Midwest because his dad had a job moving. I feel bad for the kid, honestly. When some of the big kids tried to mess with him, that's when it went down real quick. The ringleader tried to push him into the lockers, but the kid dodged him, then countered him with a putt push and an intimidating look. Wait, is this from Greg's perspective? Whatever, I don't care. Then the kid faked a left jab, then to hit him with a right hook. That kid was down four counts. Now this Zack kid was my grade, but he looked mature and older than what grade he was in. Now that he took out that kid, he was pretty much Muhammad Ali of middle school now. So the other kids backed down and ran. When the teacher saw it, he told Zack to go into the office, and he just smirked and said, Don't you mean the place where all kids go when they try to do something about something? Now! Yeah, yeah, whatever. It was bad because this guy was getting all the attention of everybody. I had always dreamed of it, but this guy came in here and took it without even trying. Anyway, I'm going to bed. GN. I will upload part two here in about two days. GN. Uh, I, ju I just want to point out here that uh, there's only two parts to this. That was part one that I just finished reading. Uh, part 1 was published December 1st, 2016. Part 2 was not posted until July 25th of 2019. And then we have Swiper Yes, which is a Dora the Explorer fanfiction on Archive of Our Own, and... Nope. 
Nope, not not going anywhere near that. Hey, Dor Dora's last name is Marquez. Is that is that canon? Or so you guys remember High School Musical, right? It was those Disney Channel original movies that got surprisingly big, and they kickstarted the careers of uh, Zac Efron and Vanessa Hudgens and nobody else. Well, that has fan fiction, obviously. Uh, here's one called The Melody of Life. Troy and Gabriella are married in this story. They experience a miscarriage and other life-changing events such as the premature birth of their daughter Melody at 25 weeks. Gabriella's health and faith are tested later on in the story. Here we go. Chapter 1, An Angel Baby. Time period, a flashback. Scene 1, The Highway. Oh, yeah, this one is written like it's a script, so if it sounds weird, that's why. Action. Carefree. Gabriella drives to the recording studio. Funny text messages from Troy entertain her. A reckless drunk driver catches her off guard. Their vehicles hit each other head on. The collision costs the truck driver his life. Gabriella is escorted to the hospital by an ambulance. And that's the end of scene one. I just want to point out, they're saying that the drunk driver did everything, but apparently she was texting while driving, so they're both at fault here. Scene two, the hospital waiting room. A doctor approaches a distraught Troy. Are you Mr. Bolton? Troy stands up from his chair. Yes. Doctor, your wife Gabriella survived the car crash. You can visit her in recovery. Troy, fighting back tears. My wife is four months pregnant. What is the baby's status? Doctor, reading the lab test results. The baby died. I am sorry for your loss. Heartbroken, Troy collapses into his chair. The doctor moves on to a new patient. He tries to stay strong for Gabriella's sake. So, th that is probably the most callous doctor ever. Like, just looking at his page saying, oh yeah, your wife had a miscarriage. Yeah, it's, it sucks. Like, they, they go through training to not do that kind of shit. It's, whatever. I'm, I'm getting too invested in this high school musical fan fiction. Scene 3, Gabriella's recovery room. Gabriella, bruised, she smiles weakly at her husband. Troy? Troy takes a seat near Gabriella's bedside. Thank God you are alive. Gabriella rubs her stomach. How is the baby? Just as when Troy is to tell Gabriella about the baby's death, a nurse enters the room carrying a fetal heartbeat monitor. The nurse, I was told you were pregnant. Gabriella beams with joy. I am indeed pregnant. I... Okay, here's the thing. If they already knew it was... Oh, she would have been told? I, whatever. The nurse, trying to locate the baby's heartbeat. Let's check the baby's heartbeat. Troy, worried. I don't hear the heartbeat. Troy, dude. Tell your wife what... Gabriella, squeezing Troy's hand. You have to listen more closely. The nurse, turning off the heartbeat machine. There is no heartbeat. Gabriella, doubtful, she begs the nurse. No, please locate the heartbeat one more time. Troy, trying to restrain Gabriella. Gabriella, Gabby. Gabriella, hysterical. I refuse to believe our baby is dead. The nurse rests a comforting hand on Gabriella's shoulder. Your baby is an angel now. Gabriella, removes the nurse's hand. Leave me alone. The nurse, preparing Gabriella for surgery. The next step is a D&C. Your wound needs to be cleaned out. You know, I gotta say, that was... I wasn't the biggest fan of the High School Musical trilogy, but I gotta say, that was always my favorite part of it, was the serious drama, the horrifying consequences for failure, the fact that anyone could die, and the surprise abortions. Those were always my favorite part of those movies. Let's do another one. This one's called Missing the One I Love. Things were going well for Troy and Gabriella until he witnesses a crime, so Troy gets put in a witness protection until the criminals are caught. Meanwhile, Gabriella does not know that her boyfriend had witnessed a crime and that he has been put in a witness protection. What is going to happen to boyfriend to Gabriella while her boyfriend is in witness protection? How many times are you going to say the word witness in one sentence? Chapter 1. Troy and his girlfriend were at their lockers getting their homework and school bags. Troy and his girlfriend shut their lockers and left their school. Troy and his girlfriend went to the car and saw the school parking lot. Troy looked over his girlfriend... Troy looked over at his girlfriend and saw that she was thinking about the same thing. Gabriella sensed her boyfriend and was looking at her. Okay, here's the thing, though. Like, up until this point, you only referred to her as Troy's girlfriend. How are we supposed to know it's Gabriella? What, are you assuming we're familiar with the source material? That, like, we have to brush up on the lore before we can even read this? Like, I, I gotta say, I'm not a fan of those types of stories. Gabriella turned her head and told her boyfriend to pay attention to pay uh, attention to the road. Troy is turned his head back and saw they were not far from his house. They arrived at his house and he parked his car. They got out of his car and grabbed their school bags. Troy locked his car up and then went over to his girlfriend. They walked to his house and went upstairs to his bedroom. Gabriella went over to her boyfriend's bed and sat down. Okay, 
any aspiring writers out there, you don't need to describe every action like that, especially if it has nothing to do with anything. Okay? This this gets this gets a uh, five stars rating. Okay? Because you you know what that prose was bad, but like the idea of Troy being put in witness protection is like just phenomenal. So just five stars, ten out of ten, hundred out of hundred. Let's go. So most of you guys probably know Dan Schneider. And if you're not familiar with him, then you're probably at least familiar with his work. In fact, I am... If you're around my age, I can guarantee you're familiar with his work in some way, because he created things like The Amanda Show, Drake and Josh, Zoe 101, iCarly, Victorious, Sam and Cat, like, a lot of those uh, Nickelodeon live-action sitcoms that they made, and I, I don't know if they still really make those, but... I don't know, whatever. He made a lot of those. He's also possibly a pedophile, but we're gonna move on past that. And so, to end this out, I was just looking at all of those shows I mentioned and realized there are so many fanfictions for all of these that are still coming out today. Because it's not that weird for an older show or movie or whatever to still have a fan base that is passionate about uh, writing fan fictions about it, but still, it takes me a little off guard when shows that have been off the air for six or ten or twelve years are still having fan fictions come out regularly. So let's start with uh, Drake and Emo Josh. Description. The rapper Drake is Josh's brother and Josh becomes Emo. Chapter 1. The Beginning. Drake and Josh were brothers. Oh, I'm sorry, it says Josh and Drake were brothers, that's... Okay. One was an autistic slob and the other was an award-winning rapper. <laughs> the two of them were brothers, but Drake was adopted. Drake had beauty and Josh had ugliness. Josh had no friends and no love. Drake had many friends and many loves. Poor Josh became emo and grew his hair long. He thought if he listened to screamo bands like Big Time Rush... It's not a fucking screamo band, you liar and grew, dyed his hair out, he would have friends. It worked, but not the way he wanted. His friends were the neglected, emo ones. Drake was lucky. He had friends, he had loves, he had a good voice, and he was black. Wait, he's lucky to be black? Okay, we're, we're not even touching that. Drake tried out for the basketball team and made the team. His team was called the Shreksters, and he was their star player, but his basketball career came to an end. Drake broke his two ribs cracked his femur, and had a swollen brain, broken hip, and lost his afro. He didn't care about his bones, he only cared about his afro. I, I thought he was a rapper, though. Like, do, do you need to be able to play basketball to be a rapper? I don't think so. Chapter 2, Losing Fat. Josh lost all his fat to get his emo body, but he went to Hot Topic all the time with his friends buying more My Chemical Romance albums to listen to with his friends. That's not Screamo, either. Josh went to Hot Topic once and found love with his emo fury. Her name was Shoddy. She was tall, skinny, had long blue hair. He knows was pierced, and that's why Josh loved her. Shoddy loved him, too. Drake was in the hospitable and recovered after a few months. He had a passion in singing, particle rapping. Okay. He started rapping, and everyone loved it. His first album was Comeback Season, and it was a hit. Drake became rich and famous. He then moved to Hidden Hills and got in love with Mia Khalifa. <laughs> they got married a week later they met. <laughs> Don't pretend you don't know who that is. Okay, I'm gonna stop there, because after that, Drake gets trampled to death, uh, and then Josh, his girlfriend, leaves him, uh, but he still works at Hot Topic, and then he gets married to a Russian man named Vladimir, and so, you know what? I think you deserve to, uh, you deserve to experience that masterpiece for yourself. Like, that's, that's another 10 out of 10. 100 out of 100. Here's one called Draking Bad. Drake and Josh think it'd be cool to make meth, although they are freaking dummies. Parentheses, this is PG. And it is written by Pelican Slut 6664-20069. Oh wait, it's 666-420-69. I cool. Chapter 1. It was a dark and stormy night. Drake had finished pounding the local slut bag in San Diego. Hey, Josh, check out this new hip candy I found, yo, Drake exclaimed. Drake, you bumbling hooligan, that isn't candy, that is methamphetamine, which is for fucking nerds, Josh replied intimately. This is not PG. You're the fucking nerd, you nerd. 
After arguing about the meth for two minutes, they both came up with ideas. We can use this meth and throw it at people, Drake said. Or we can do the just thing and hand it over to the police. That's, that's not the just thing. That's fucking kosher. I'm a rebel. We should make more of this and sell it, Drake proposed. Drake, are you out of your mind? No, I'm just peachy. Mm -hmm. Drake felt attacked by Josh's remarks. While they were both bickering, Megan overheard it all. Guys, you're a bunch of boobs. We can all become millionaires of this shit, Megan said. Can you, though? But Megan, Drake rebutted, you already have millions off of iCarly, the new hit show now on Nickelodeon. Watch now, audience, please, Drake subliminally advertised. Yeah, the new hit show that went off the air in 2012. But I want to make more. I can never have enough of that green shit. I have a guy that can give you some, Drake offered. Not that green stuff, I mean money. While they were talking, Josh vanished as he, we already asked Craig and Eric on how to make meth. Oh, for those of you who have forgotten, because you haven't seen it in forever, Craig and Eric were the nerdy friends of theirs that went to their school. You simply put the lime in the coconut, Eric said. And then? And then what? Josh asked. Listen closely, Eric said. This is the most important part. Josh leaned closer to make sure he hears Eric's lessons. You take the lime, put it in the coconut, and shake it all up. That's how you make meth, Craig reassured to Josh. Thanks, Craig and Eric. I'll give you a share if we make any money. You can fuck Mindy as payments. Oh, for those of you who forgot, Mindy was Josh's girlfriend. Score, Craig and Eric proclaim in unison. Josh returns to Drake and Megan with the good news. We can start cooking now. We just need somewhere to do it. Inconspicuous. Inconspicu. Josh advised. Josh, we don't want to be racist here. This is PG fanfiction, Drake also advised. He didn't say anything racist, you Galumba, Megan told Drake. Drake began to sniffle a bit, realizing the arrow of his ways. I... I, I don't even see how that could be construed as racist in any way. Cool. So, I think that's enough Drake and Josh. Let's move on to another show in the Dan, maybe a child molester, Schneider catalog. Uh, so, here's a victorious one, which, if you don't remember victorious, that was the one where Victoria Justice tried to have a career for a while, and then sh she didn't, but, you know, it gave us Ariana Grande, so it worked out okay. Uh, here's one called Aviana Reunion. Avan Jogia has a crush on Ariana Grande for the past decade, but doesn't believe she feels the same way. But everything changes when Ariana asked him to join her in her Thank You Next tour. So, this one is kind of weird because it's not even, like, it's a romance story, obviously, but it's not shipping characters, it's shipping the actors that play those characters, and it's supposed to take place in the real world. It's... Um... Okay. Chapter 1. This is an Aviana smut. This takes place shortly after Ariana and Pete broke their engagement. All of it is Avon's point of view. I do not own anything. Note, this was originally going to be a really long one-chapter story, but then I realized it would probably take forever. Also, I thought it'd be better if this story was in certain chapters. Okay, so for background, uh, Ariana Grande and Pete Davidson, this guy, were engaged for a while, but they broke it off a while ago, and uh, Avon Georgia, Horgia, I, I honestly don't know how to say it, but whatever, he's this guy. He was also in Victorious, and I don't like dudes, but I could make an exception for him. I'm in my one-bedroom apartment, sitting down on my sofa, watching some TV while eating a salad. After I was done, I went into the kitchen and put the dishes in the sink. I got a water bottle out of the fridge before I heard knocking. I groaned. That better not be the landlord again. I told him I would have the rent money for him tomorrow, yesterday. Wait. Oh. Oh, okay, so you're supposed to have the rent money for your landlord. Well, pay him. Okay, he's a parasite, but he has the police on his side. I was relieved to see it was the mailman. I opened the door and saw he was holding a package. Hey, Frank, I greeted. Hey, Avon, I got a package for you, he said, handing it to me. After signing a paper, I said, thanks, have a good day. You too, bro, he said before leaving. I looked at the tag and my eyes went wide. The package was, for, the package was from Ariana Grande. I felt my heart flutter. It's been nearly three years since we last saw each other. The last time was when we had a victorious Christmas reunion with some of the others. I have a confession to make. I've had a crush on her ever since we first met, just before we auditioned for Victorious. But I've never had the courage to tell her. I've never told anyone about my crush. Besides, I didn't think she had any kind of feelings towards me. Then, after Victorious ended, we didn't see or talk to each other much. Since then, she's blossomed into one of the most popular singers in the entire world. A top five singer at best, along with Taylor Swift, Katy Perry, etc. She's also been an inspiration to millions around the world. She's also dated some men. Kai Brooks, Big Sean, and recently Pete Davidson. I really di didn't like him. I didn't think he was good for her, but I was shocked when I heard they got engaged, and they'd been dating for only a couple of months. 
As much as I didn't like the image of her and Pete as husband and wife, I did my best to push my feelings aside and be happy for her. If she thought he was a good man, then who was I to argue? Luckily, they ended up breaking their engagement. Anyways, I opened the package and I was surprised to see a extra-large Thank You Next t-shirt. There was also a small white box. I opened it and I was shocked to see it was her Thank You Next fragrance. It hasn't been out in stores yet. Lastly, I saw an envelope. I opened it, and it was a ticket. It was a ticket to one of her upcoming concerts in Chicago, and it said VIP on it. The envelope also had a card. It was a backstage pass. I debated whether or not I should go to her concert, but I realized it'd be wrong for me not to go, especially since she went to great lengths to get me this stuff. I mean, great lengths? I feel it. Whatever. The concert was in three days, and I didn't have time to spare, so I packed the next day and I made sure to pay the landlord before leaving to the nearest airport. Chapter 2. Title. Here is the second chapter. I made sure to pay for first class so I could avoid having to sit by annoying fans. Don't get me wrong, I adore my fans just as much as Ariana does, but sometimes they can get loud and obnoxious. I just want to be able to relax until we get to Chicago. Does Avon Georgia have fans? Because, I mean, like, he was in Victorious, but that show ended six years ago, and since then, w w has he really done anything? Like, ooh, he's going to be in Zombieland 2. That's, that's cool, I guess. I'm sure that'll get you swarmed by legions of fans all the time, like... The... No, no, I'm not trying to shit on the dude too much, but like, what... What's going on here? The concert wasn't happening for another two days, so I just ended up taking advantage of relaxing, going over the jacuzzi every once in a while. The night of the concert, I left my room and took out my phone to call for a cab, only to accidentally bump into a man. Oh, sorry, didn't mean to run into you, I said. You Avon Jojia? <laughs> he asked. I furrowed my eyebrows. Yes? We have a private limousine arranged for you, he replied. I grinned. Thank you, Ari, I thought to myself. I made sure to put that shirt Ari got me for the concert. <laughs> so, wait, like, they had a private limo for him, but they didn't call him about it or anything before him? Whatever. Okay, so it kind of goes on like that for a while. Eventually, he meets her. She's very obviously into him still. Like, she had a crush on them when they were younger. Whatever. It's, like, cute romance stuff. Um... The only part that's weird is when they go to Manchester and the author spends like three chapters talking about that whole terrorist thing that happened. Um, and that was kind of awkward, all things considered. Other than that, it's just... I just find it bizarre that, that they would ship the actors that play the characters instead of... I don't know, man. People are weird. This next one is also Victoria's fanfiction and it's called The End of Hollywood. All is well in Hollywood arts, until one day Tori gets sick, then Cat, then Robbie, and before anyone knew what was happening, the world began to crumble around them with an unknown parasite killing off everyone. Mainly horror and suspense, but ships Jory along with some others, rated M for violence and death. What? Like, how, how, do, how do you see this? Oh, stop. That's it? That's your fan? Yeah. It's not big and come to the conclusion that, you know what that needs? That needs, like, to be an apocalyptic story, okay? That needs to have death and destruction around every corner. How do you come to that? Whatever. Okay, so the last victorious one is called A Cat's 24th Birthday by Lord Jeremy Silver, and I know I said I would stay away from the weird sex ones, and I'm not gonna read all of this, but I kind of just want to read the title, Cat's 24th Birthday, alternative title, Bukaki for B-Day. Um, summary, Kat turns 24 today, and as a gift, some guys that she know have decided to give her Bukaki. When they told Kat this, she got happy. Now she's on her knees in the bedroom. And, as I said, not reading that, but all of these will be in the description, so if you want to read about that, uh, it's down there, you fucking degenerates. You remember iCarly, right? Had Miranda Cosgrove from Drake and Josh, but she was older and stuff in it, and she had a web show and stuff. Anyways, I'm missing. When Carly mysteriously disappears one night, Spencer ventures out to find her, but some things are not what they seem. It was an ordinary day. That's the surprising part about days that change your life. It's completely normal, until it isn't. One decision can immediately affect the course of everything. It was a Friday. I had just come home from whatever the fuck I was doing. Shopping, painting, something completely mundane. I was excited about something and wanted to tell my sister, Carly, about it. 
So I guess this is from her older brother's perspective. Cool. I had met a guy who could swallow fire, and I'd asked him if he would appear on iCarly, my sister's webcast. I knew she would be stoked to hear that he thought that was a great idea. I opened the door leading to my apartment. The lights were off, and I felt the chill entering my spine. Something was definitely off. Maybe she's upstairs, I thought, as I turned the lights on and went upstairs. Okay, so, as a brief aside, you, if you remember the apartments that they lived in in iCarly, like, they lived in downtown Seattle. Like, how much would that have cost? I felt a slight nervousness bubbling within, as if I was anticipating for something to happen. I turned to Carly's door and opened it slowly. The room was filled in stillness. She isn't here. I tried to shake my doubts away, but still they remained. A million scenarios magnified in my mind. What could have happened to Carly while I was gone? I needed to slow things down as I took a deep breath and released. I closed the door and headed back downstairs. So, he tries calling her friends, he tries calling her, he can't get a hold of her. And then, the only person I trusted at this time was Marissa Benson, my neighbor. Although her methods of raising a child differed from mine, without her, I wouldn't known how to take care of Carly. The door clanged open. Marissa stood, peering watchfully at me for a few seconds. Did she not recognize me? After realizing it was me, she then opened the door. Sorry, Spencer, I wasn't expecting someone this late, said Marissa. Her face was drained of color, eyes puffy and shadowed in dark circles. She motioned for me to follow her in the hallway leading to her living room. It was clear that something was wrong with Marissa. Her usual composure was gone, and now all I could see was her tenseness in the way she moved. Okay, I don't know how this author is managing to do this, but they're somehow putting too much detail and not enough in there at the exact same time. I don't know if that's impressive or not, but... So, to end this off, I don't really want to read anymore, but I did find one more iCarly fanfiction, and it's called Pulse, Season 1. Freddie Benson will begin college, and after a shocking series of events, will become a crime-fighting superhero known as Pulse. This show is kind of a spin-off TV series of my creation. Several OCCs, as well as a few familiar faces. I hope everyone likes it. There is SETI in the future. Stay tuned. Now, that's kind of weird on its own. Like, you watch iCarly and you think, you know what this needs? One of the main characters needs to become a superhero. That's, that's weird on its own. The weirdest thing is that this was first published September 12th, 2013. It was updated in July of 2018, so they kept this up for over five years, or almost five years, and it has over 539,000 words written so far, and apparently it's still ongoing. For context, the Lord of the Rings trilogy, all three books combined, is about 470,000 words long. Why would you put that much effort into a superhero alternate universe iCarly fanfiction? Like, I'm not trying to disparage anyone for, like, write what you want, I get that. It's, it's not going to appeal to me, it's not going to appeal to a lot of people, but you know what, that's your thing, that's your thing, you enjoy it, you have fun with it. But I just, what? How do you even think of something like that? Where do you... So I did it. I did a whole long fanfiction thing with ruining everybody's childhoods, and there was no weird sex stuff in there. There was almost no weird sex stuff in there. And, I don't know, I haven't done this in a long time, I stopped doing it. I don't even know why I stopped doing it, I just never continued, and, uh, I don't know, just let, let me know if you liked it, let me know if you want me to try and do some more of this once in a while, and I'll, I'll see what I can do. And, thanks for watching, thanks to all my patrons, especially thanks to Abhiraj Singh, Apo Savalainen, I know I'm saying that wrong, but I, I haven't gotten confirmation on how to say it right, uh, Christopher Hawkins, David Martinez, Joseph Pendergraft, and Melanie Austin, and, you know, all the other names as well. You guys are, you guys are great, and if you haven't already, then rate the video, comment on the video, subscribe to my channel, because I need money, and I don't want to get a real job again, so...